the compiler thing that when you go to the website, you type in the contract name, and what you get is for almost every contract, the source code that is kind of human readable, uh, which I think is a new thing because before EVM there weren't that many decompilers that could allow you to create source, like to view the source of, of most of the contracts. And I really, I built this whole thing out of uh, frustration with Etherscan because it only, like, it doesn't allow you to access a lot of source codes easily and, and a lot of source codes are not open there. Uh, so I said, hmm, I will just build a decompiler that, that allows anyone to see any source and, and it will be open so anyone can start their own thing and work with it and fiddle with it. So, so that was one of the main motivations behind, behind doing this. So we go to the website and most of the contracts you see decompiled, right? And the second cool thing, which is I think even cooler, is that for every contract there is this intermediate form. So this is the same thing as this, but but in this, all right, one of my friends came, all right. <laughs> I'm crossing you off the list, from the list of friends that didn't come, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's right. Why? Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can write to the others that there is a list, right? <laughs> all right, <clears throat> so, so anyway, there is this intermediate form, which is quite cool, because it's, uh, I know that it looks like gibberish, but it's, it's really a JSON representation of every single contract out there. And it's quite nice because the way it's constructed is uh, it's constructed in such a way that it's very easy to analyze by machines. So we can write very simple, uh, very simple analyzers for source codes, and, and you can get uh, like you can you can do a lot of cool stuff. But I will talk about it in the end uh, a little bit. So anyway, again, the decompiled form and this, right? And there are of course other tools uh, that are uh, yeah that are in the same uh, theme, so there is Metro, for example, that, that is doing symbolic execution of every contract and, and tries to figure out what are, what are the potential bugs there, right? Uh, there is Manticore uh, that does a similar thing from, from Trail of Bits. And there are some other decompilers, uh, but they decompile to Solidity, and I don't like curly brackets, if I know you also not like them. Uh, anyway, mm, in, this, uh, in this quick talk at workshop, uh, I will talk a little bit about what symbolic execution is, because that's the basis of the whole decompiler. And that's a basis for a lot of security tools and contract analysis tools. So I will explain how exactly it works. And then I will explain a few different things related to symbolic execution and how various tools solve them. Uh, so it gives you a better understanding on, on, well, essentially how these things work and perhaps it will allow you to build your own thing or, or just use those things better. Then I will talk about some crazy stuff that I had to do to make, to make the results uh, look so pretty. And in the end, I will show you a little bit more about the broader context of, of the whole uh, like the compiler slash contract analysis uh, space. And I think it will take around, I don't know, an hour probably, and then we'll have some more, like a lot of time for questions and answers and more to relax that atmosphere and, and whatnot. All right, so symbolic execution. How many of you know what symbolic execution is? So, all right, a, a few of you. All right, cool. Um, so, um, so the idea with symbolic execution is that you have, uh, like, when you execute the regular code, uh, yeah, like it's always the beginnings of all the presentations people coming in and out. Uh, so, you you have the assembly. Right? And, and you have the assembly code. And the virtual machine of Ethereum works by executing that code and you know, it sees, I don't know, push something on stack and then it pushes that thing on the stack, right? Then it sees pops from stack and it pops from, from stack and just executes command by command, right? And that's how the whole virtual machine works. Symbolic execution is essentially the same thing, but you don't deal with concrete values. So you start the program and you know, if, if the program says push number one on stack, you also have the stack and you push number one on the stack, right? But if the program says put call data or, or some something that you don't know because you're you're not running an actual transaction, you push this uh, uh, this uh, this variable or this symbol on the stack, right? So here, for example, this function has uh, has an assembly command saying call value, right? So it wants to push call value on the stack. 
regular virtual machine would just push that concrete value that was you know the value of the call on the stack. And in my case, uh, like it pushes just you know it writes on the stack. There is some call value. I don't know what it is, but just I push it there, right? <coughs> what happens then is you know there are other things that operate on the stack. So uh, so you know is zero command for example. You know, grabs a thing from the stack, negates it, and then puts it back on stack. Right? It puts one if there is, uh, if it's zero, and it puts zero if there is, if it's anything else. So with regular virtual machine, it's easy because you just have regular arithmetic. With symbolic virtual machine, you have to like you know construct a special expression, and you, what you push on the stack is you push this value saying, oh, is zero, call value in this example, right? Is this kind of clear, or uh, yeah? Like it's it's a little bit difficult talking to a varied audience because I don't want to you know bore some some of the people, but I want to be uh, I want it to, to be still understanding the rest. Uh, so so yeah, another example here, and you know pushing this value on the stack. So now we have stack with two values, is zero and sixteen ninety one. And then the fun part is when you have jumps. Because regular virtual machine, when it sees uh, something like this, jump, if, right? Like, it just checks what's the value of the stack. If it's, if it's higher than zero, then it makes the jump. If it's zero, then it doesn't make the jump. And it's quite straightforward. It just continues execution. But when you're running a symbolic execution, you have to essentially fork the whole virtual machine and now run it in parallel, right? Because you don't know if the jump is performed or not, because you don't know what's the value of the stack, because it's E0 call value, right? So it can be anything. So you have to kind of fork the state and then execute everything below simultaneously, right? So so you just you know call here and, and then execute here from here, from this point on, right? So so you kind of execute and, and continue execution. And and yeah, and you just execute one line by line and and at the end, uh, what you uh, in case of the, the compilation, what I, what I do is whenever there is something interesting to the user that changes the state of the contract or whatnot, I print it out, right? So this, this thing's in bold, revert, else, if, this is really the decompiled code, right? So if, if someone uh, in the contract writes to a storage somewhere, it would be aligned right to the storage. And all the rest, it gets just removed, right? And, and, and like what, what the decompiled code is really like this trace of execution uh, of, of the symbolic machine and and that's roughly it. So I don't know there is some kind of storage write, right? And I just write, you know, writing to the storage and that's the part of the program that actually gets shown to the user. So at the end, uh, for this simple function, let's ignore this, you know, we had like a series of ifs and we went deeper here. So so you know there is if, there is if, there is if and whatnot. So this is the decompiled form. So essentially, I just executed the whole program symbolically, and I printed out all the storage writes, all the ifs, all the reverts, everything. And this is this is it, right? And that took me like two weeks to, to build uh, when I started. And uh, by the way, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. So I just grabbed the CryptoKitties smart contract, and I said, I want to know what's going on there. Uh, I didn't know that it's called symbolic execution, actually, like Rambo told me that. <laughs> uh, so the problem with this is, uh, this is the output that you will actually see on some of the decompilers that use that. <coughs> I think Etherscan has uh, recently added a decompiler there. Uh, like this, this is angry. <laughs> like, in reality, the function is way, way simpler, right? It's just, uh, uh, yeah, in reality, the function is really much, much simpler. Just uh, the, the execution took so many paths that it kind of split here. So there are other algorithms in, in case of my decompiler that merge this. I will talk about it in the late, later. So the whole function looks like this, right? So we went from assembly code, executing it line by line, to, to this huge tree of execution, right? And then we folded it to something much simpler. And right? that's the decompiled function, one of them. Yeah? So could you increase the font size if it's possible? Uh, OK. Uh, it's, it's difficult with the slides. I, Maybe you can come closer. Yeah, if, uh, like I have to come closer, sorry. Because I cannot, I cannot re redo the slides right now. Here it's still like 
Yeah. Empty seats. Yeah, there are some empty seats. Uh, I, I apologize for that. I didn't know how big would, would the screen be, so uh, I cannot really uh, right now. But I will remember for, for the future. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, I guess no one else will complain now about the. <laughs> Yeah. Nah. So the other thing that uh, <coughs> that is done uh, is uh, for any contract I can figure out all the functions and then I can figure out what are the getter functions for some storages and uh, based on that I can say, oh, this function returns this storage, this function's name is CFO address, so so this storage's name is CFO address and then I end up with very nice code that just doesn't have Right, that is readable. So, so, so that's it. Uh, yeah, that's mm, that's like the outline of, of what the decompiler does and how symbolic execution uh, works. And uh, any questions here? I will not move anyone to the front seat for that. What proportion of the routines do you have to collapse to smaller? Oh, that's uh, like I noticed some of them. It's a very satisfactory uh, feeling when you work on that folder to the collapse. Like I would say, most of them have some kind of things to, that you, that need collapsing. But it was like super nice, um, super nice experience to work on these folding algorithms because some of the functions initially were like you know screens and screens and screens in land, and then uh, you write a good algorithm and they fall to this short and tiny thing that's super obvious. So, so I, I can't give you the proportion, but, but some of the functions are extremely long without, without this folding. Uh, I saw a question there. Oh, well, yeah, I don't have this. Uh, does it have to be about symbolic execution or, gene or general questions are okay right now? Yeah, general questions okay. Okay, I'm just wondering, so like, this is, this is, a, this is decompiling things to Viper? Uh, so it's decompiling, uh, it's decompiling to a pseudocode, really, uh, based on Python, so it's not pure Viper. Okay, I was, really, I was, I was going to ask, like, how do you handle various stuff that Viper doesn't normally do? Yeah, <laughs> so, so in general, like, that's a question that often comes up is, can you decompile to something that can be recompiled? And really, like, it's very hard to, 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 to do something that is not just, uh, uh, just a, some kind of a pseudocode, because exactly of the stuff that, uh, like, either Viper or Solidity, they have, they, like it's hard to uh, to really uh, decompile to something that can be recompiled. So so it's just yeah uh, yeah. Uh, I think how, how do you do the mapping for the function names and the function identifier? I mean they they are libraries, but I, you don't know all of the function names. I will be talking about that. Okay, awesome. Okay, good. Same question. All right. <laughs> okay, so is folding more or less the same as optimizing? No. I mean, the, is it like correct translation? Oh yes, it is. Yeah. So what I mean, where where I'm heading with this question is, uh, you weren't probably on the you talk by no. Solidity. So they have this intermediate language, right? Yeah. And it doesn't seem, you know, too high level. But what they do is that they have this optimizer regulator, which is like collapsing really a lot of stuff, right? And <coughs> maybe. Viper or Solidity is not the good target for, for you know this, but maybe, maybe you is. Yeah, I think it's always best to try and work with existing tools, right? So yeah, I mean it doesn't so exist either. I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah, too, yeah. So it would be nice if you people switch to my intermediate form. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's like, good. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like they, they they don't know how to team play, you know? Like they don't want to switch to my thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So those two questions will be answered later on. Anyway. Uh, so there are other symbolic execution engines, uh, and there is a lot of them, and I will be talking about Kestrel Institute work and, and about, about other teams uh, working, but like two significant ones that you might bump into. One of them is Material uh, from uh, Consensus Diligence, right? So they use very, a very similar process. So whenever you have to work with Material, like, you know, down D, that's what they do. That's what Material does. And, uh, Roughly. So it executes the whole code and it tries, like one of the things that Dimitri does, right, is, is it executes the whole code symbolically. And then Manticore from tra Trail of Bits, they do analysis and verification of the software, right? And they use very, very similar approach to the one that I just described. So they execute the whole program and, and they just uh, symbolically. So if you understand the symbolic execution part, you really are, like, you, you really understand how 
like the most significant tools of, of the market right now operate. Uh, it's worth spending some time to, to work on that. Uh, now, symbolic execution is uh, like this is the that was the easy part, right? And uh, there are a few super super difficult things uh, that most of the tools don't solve properly. Sometimes neither one of them solves. And I would say out of, I don't know, eight months, spent like full time working on this whole thing, uh, I spent like probably half of the time doing memory handling, another half loop processing, I studied with explosion, that was this folding thing. I did that in an afternoon, but it's like, I don't understand how it works that I wrote it. So. so I will talk a little bit about memory handling now, and then loop processing, and then move to the like tiny things that, uh, that you, you ask about. So memory handling. I told you how uh, symbolic execution engine executes the program, right? And it's easy when it's just stack. So put some value on the stack, get some value from the stack. If there is an if, just split the state or whatnot. But what happens if someone pushes some variable on the stack and then tries to write to the memory to that value, right? Like the question is, I know as long as as you write to program writes to a very concrete number in memory. So if it writes to the number, I don't know, 64, right, the, the virtual machine can just say, okay, at, at the address 64, there is this value, right? Later on, program reads from 64, it just grabs this value and executes it, right? That's, that's very easy. Yeah, you just create an array uh, that represents the memory, and, and you just run it. Uh, the question is, what happens if the program takes some unknown variable, I don't know, let's say x or, or whatever, it says, you know, write to this memory at the position x, right? And then it says, read from memory position x plus 1. And you have to figure out, your whole execution engine now has to figure out if this x plus 1 is really, like, what's there, right? Is it the thing that was written in x and just moved, you know, slightly off? Like, perhaps it was overwritten by something else? Uh, like, how, how do you deal with that? It's um, quite, quite a difficult challenge, right? So you can imagine, for example, and these are the real cases. The program says, write to the memory position x. Okay, so you remember that there is something at the position x. <laughs> and then it says, write to the memory at position 64. So remember that it's at 64, right? And then it says, read from the memory position x. But you don't know if 64 was x, so if this memory was overwritten or not, right? So, so you may get stuck at some, some point. And it's quite, like seriously difficult challenge. So I looked in January, it may, perhaps they improved it, uh, at Mithril. So the way Mithril handled it was at in January. So again, it, it, perhaps they, they fixed it. Like whenever it reached some symbolic memory, so memory where it was written in just, you know, some, some variable, it just gave up. So that was the Mithril way. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, you have the whole execution and then, okay, symbolic memory, I give up. I, I don't know. I, like, next function, please. Uh, that's why you didn't have a full coverage in Mithril uh, oftentimes. Manticore, what they did was, and that was a very similar way uh, Evie at the beginning handled that, um, is they use, like, some very, very, like complex structure and SMT solvers, which uh, which help with kind of managing this algebra, right? So so SMT solvers help you to figure out this math when you deal with symbols, roughly. Uh, so so Manticore uses SMT solvers uh, and has these complicated memory structures. Uh, and I had that at the beginning too. The problem was that it was a little bit uh, slow at times, and and you could see that I think in Manticore and. The second problem was that sometimes the programs get so complicated that, that really that, that doesn't cut it. Uh, so I spent like two months rebuilding the whole memory model to, to arrive at, at something that I will show you, which is I think quite neat. So okay, this is the demo time. <laughs> Can I grab a chart? Yes. All right, they are not locked. <laughs> so. I actually open sourced EVIM uh, two days ago. So any one of you, it's an MIT license, any one of you can, can see it. And, you know, EVIM by itself, the sources are a testament to, to the power of duct tape engineering and cowboy coding, like the, the best practices in those, in those 
uh, in those areas of programming are all implemented there. Uh, so it works quite nice, uh, but it's been battle tested a lot of times. So, so it works quite nicely. You just you know type in the contract name or a shortcut for CryptoKitties, and it gets decompiled. So CryptoKitties take around eight seconds to decompile it fully. Which I think maybe is like it's way way faster than Manticore. It's around the same speed as as, as Material. So anyway, you get just the sources everywhere, like for all the contracts, right? <laughs> but now the stuff I implemented just for DevCon. Uh, if you fetch it in from uh, uh, from GitHub, <coughs> you, you have this parameter called explain that shows you how it works exactly and I can increase font size <laughs> here, <laughs> right? So, so I have this uh, one function, and this is what you saw in the previous step, right? So, so there is assembly, there is stack, and you can preview stuff that is happening here, right? So, so we have here push, right? And then you have memory load, and this gets stored as, uh, as something. So cleaning up all the assembly, right? It looks like this. Whenever I encounter, uh, where, whenever EDM encounters uh, a memory read, it doesn't try to analyze it at first. So it just pushes out to the single assignment variable. Oh, there was a read from memory 64. Like I don't, you know, like I don't care like how exactly it tied to the rest of the thing. It was just a read from memory 64. It's number one, variable number one. Whenever it uses the, uh, this memory, it just puts into the code, you know, underscore one. So that's, that's the first iteration that comes out of the initial decompilation process. And then what it does is, sorry, I need a little bit of water. So yeah. What happens then is uh, it goes in a loop, and in a loop it tries to optimize the whole thing, clean it up, simplify it as much as possible. And in case of this function, for example, first thing that it does, it tries to inline all the variables. So it can see here, you know, there is variable underscore one, it's being used here, so it can inline it, so it can put it here, right? Easy. Now, it doesn't put it here. And uh, an idea why? Doesn't get in line here. <coughs> so um, because it can be overwritten, right? Yeah. Like it, it's a like th uh, there is a lot of uh, you know, things to analyze when you want to inline something. So this variable can be inlined here because it doesn't get uh, overwritten for sure in the meantime, right? Mm -hmm. Like for sure it's not overwritten. But here, right now, like we don't know because perhaps this. This overrides this, this memory, right? So if I would just put in memory 64, like it would be incorrect because memory 64, we would mean this memory 64, not, 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 not this one, right? So, so right now it cannot be overridden. So for uh, the way it goes is that for every, like it grabs every variable and then goes line by line and checks if, if the value of the variable was overwritten in the meantime. Because if it was, potentially was, it has to stop the process and doesn't inline anywhere anywhere further, right? So this was the first step. It went through all the variables, inlined them wherever possible, and and then the next step is, of course, inlining all the memory. The same process, right? So it grabs all the memory, and so it grabs this memory, and uh, first this memory, right? It can put it here, right? It can put, put it here, then it also sees like, you know, it checks everywhere where it can put it, and kind of, we end up with already something that is slightly simpler. Uh, it goes like this in, the, in circles, and also tries to simplify whenever it can the whole thing, right? So after the next iteration, we don't have the variables here, because we, we could finally, you know, replace this with this, because this is a concrete value. Then it, it can simplify things, so you know it also goes there and tries to figure out what are the expressions that can be simplified. So it can see here that it, this is 96 minus 64, so it's 32. Then it sees that okay, this program returns memory 96, 32 bytes, 
So, so this is essentially this. So we can also put it here, and then ends up with this super super nice, very simple thing, right? So we went from this complex thing to this very tiny one layer function, and uh, like it's super rewarding working on the decompiler, by the way, because like the way. It is, it's like almost entering this crazy battery room or whatever. You see this crazy, crazy huge function, and then you you see the decompiler simplifying a lot of stuff, and then you try to figure out, all right, what are the other rules that are not yet in the system that I could implement that are correct, uh, mathematically speaking, and, and that would also simplify the program, right? And because uh, because EDM is so, so fast, uh, like I can I can test it on, on thousands of contracts, so 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 whenever for every release I can just look for contracts that weren't simplified enough and just find all the missing rules and try to simplify that and just you know work with that and, and end up with something that simplifies most of the contracts for example. So uh, one more thing that it does is you know I told you about this intermediate form. It's also quite nice because it's uh, it allows us to really analyze the program very well. So, you know, it took a, just a few moments to write this, inform figure out what kind, of, uh, what kind of stuff can the function return, right? So we can see that the function returns this story, for example, right? <coughs> it's very sim simple to see if the function is payable, because we just check if there is a require at the beginning, checking for that. We can check if the function is read-only, because we can see uh, if it uses some storage rights or some calls, right? And if we have all of those things, we can figure out that this function is really a getter. So it returns only value for a certain storage, in this case, storage 2. So if we know the name of the function, and we know that it's read-only, it means it's a getter for a given storage, so we can figure out, oh, this storage name is, we can name it after the function, and it's okay, <laughs> right? It will be probably more or less correct with the, with the original. Okay, back to the slides. Uh, any questions here? What happens if you return a ball, but you return the um, negation of the ball? So, if, for example, if you don't return pause, do you turn the uh, Yeah, ball? so there's like a million edge cases, <laughs> right? So, negation is one simple thing, but then uh, actually for Booleans, I, you, I only do that for very specific function names because there are so many various edge cases that, that uh, I usually don't name storage after the booleans. For example, sometimes uh, mm, the booleans returned are really indexes of arrays. So, uh, because there is a function called are there any tokens, right? And they check if the token's uh, size is uh, higher than zero. So I cannot really name the whole storage are there any tokens because the storage name is really tokens, right? So, so in this case, usually the naming is uh, like very, like very few cases where, where actually it makes sense to name the storage after, after that. But it's funny that people ask about the namings and uh, the functions because like, that took like the least amount of time in the whole decompiler, right? <laughs> and I remember pitching it to uh, yeah, like, it was uh, like, you know, the first question people ask, and that was the easiest part, really. <laughs> but it's, I'm happy to answer that. Anyway, there's the second part, and that's the loop processing. And uh, I, I don't think there is another tool on the market, correct me, if like there are some other people from other 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 security uh, teams, uh, but I don't think there is at least an open source tool that actually handles loops properly. Uh, that means that uh, the last time I checked, either Material, Manticore, or any other, I think the compilers uh, figured out loops, and I will show you what I mean. Uh, so the problem is we have some kind of assembly. Right? And the way it works in virtual machine, you write a code that is a loop that iterates over something in, in solidity, it gets compressed to like it gets compiled to this, so you know, push some index, jump if this index is bigger or smaller than zero, right? And then and then subtract, jump back and just you know go in circles. So essentially this is this. Now when we do a symbolic execution, the problem is that if we don't discover what the loops are, we will just see a series of ifs. So we will just see if x bigger than zero, decrease x, if x bigger than zero, decrease x, and just go infinitely deeper uh, into that hole, and else you know, continue the execution or, or whatever. Right? This is 
super difficult to figure out. But at what point do you figure out? Uh, oh, this is I'm really in a loop. Like I'm I'm just throwing. You know, I'm executing the same code. It's not as simple as figuring out that this, it was the same line in code because sometimes uh, for various reasons. But you know, turning this into something like this on the fly is really like seriously. I cannot explain exactly the algorithm because I don't fully understand what I wrote there, but it works. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I kind of, you know, like this This was the craziest stuff I ever wrote because I kind of understand bits and pieces of it if I focus very hard. So I think I know, I know that it's correct, but like my mind that fails to grasp the whole complexity of what's going on there. Like I cannot imagine what's, what's going on there. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it kind of get, gets turned here. And uh, I think some other symbolic tools that I saw they don't handle this at all, so that's another place will, where they will break. So, for example, uh, they will just go deeper until they experience a timeout, and they will say, "Okay, I give up. I don't analyze stuff any further." So, this is another reason why I think, again, half a year ago, Mitri and Manticore would pay a lot of contracts or a lot of actions, but they couldn't. They didn't make this connection, this jump here. So I will not explain exactly how this works, but the sources are public. If you can clean up the code and understand how the contract explains better than, than I can, go ahead. I will appreciate it. I don't know if it's physically possible, but perhaps it is. <clears throat> so now, don't find a lot of code here. But after the first iteration, the decompiler figures out, magically, let's say, that there was some kind of a loop here. Like the program encountered so, some kind of a loop, and there was this one, uh, index variable that starts with zero, okay? So this was the index variable, and then there was this, uh, here the loop really ends, so index variable gets increased, and it gets back here, and it kind of executes, and then sometimes it goes to these paths, so essentially ends the program. Super unreadable, right? So it's, it's hard to, to understand what's going on here. <coughs> so after the first task, that's, that's what we end up with. And that crazy algorithm like, turns uh, original assembly into something like this, which is still not, not nice enough. <coughs> uh, we can also figure out, OK, this is the condition. Because if this doesn't get fulfilled, it will continue. And if it does, there is some other program where there are no continues here. right? So, so this is the condition of the loop. And what we can go can do is we just look at the program and we say, all right, this looks like a while loop. So we can replace all of this with something simpler. So there is a while here, right? Continue, and then the rest of the program. So like this is relatively simple compared to like the loop detection. It also shows a lot of power in just working and rewriting the whole the whole uh, the whole decompiled program and, uh, for, for analysis purposes. Because if this for whatever reason fails, like the failsafe is that we end up with something like this, which is still kind of readable, right? So there is this graceful, uh, graceful, uh, uh, graceful degradation when when the decompiler fails to understand something. So anyway, we end up with this, but it's still ugly, right? So, uh, so we, uh, you know, we can again inline the variables. Uh, we can, we can again convert into oh yeah. So we inline variables. And then what we end up with is this loop. And I know the text is barely uh, visible from there. Like for, you know, <clears throat> like to make you slightly happier, if you are sitting here, like you wouldn't understand it very well because there's too many letters anyway. Right? So, <laughs> so that's not really about it. Uh, so <laughs> the thing that you have to believe back there is that this loop is really a memory copy loop. So what it does is, it copies this memory from this index to this memory in a circle, right? So now the decompiler, it sees, uh, it has certain patterns that it kind of recognizes and can, let's say, it could prove mathematically that they're really mem uh, loops and they, the only thing that those loops do is just move memory from one place to another. So of course it can remove the loops altogether and we end up with some, with just a statement saying copy this memory of this land no, this this memory to this memory, and you know, like 
the goal when I was building the decompiler was really to get rid of all the loops because loops are, make it crazy difficult to analyze analyze smart contracts. So you know, like I think for 95, 99 percent of the loops, we can really replace them with some other statements that are very easy to to analyze with, uh, to analyze with other with other programs. So like a lot of statements got removed, and you will not actually see loops in the output code. Even though in this actual case, like the original Solidity had loops, so so it simplified it even more than the original. But this is still not readable enough. Like this is some crazy numbers and whatnot. So we continue on inlining everything. So we clean up variables. You can see less text. Okay. After some more inlining, you can see more text. And actually, there was a lot of design decisions here because sometimes, like, what do you consider simpler? What do you consider more human readable? Where should you stop? Right. So my idea here was, okay, I want to inline everything at the start. Like, remove, in, yeah, inline everything possible, remove all the loops, and then kind of just for the human readability, kind of clean it up and perhaps add some variables here and there so it's more readable at the end. Uh, this is kind of different from many decompilers that, that's just, yeah, different. So anyway, this is, this is not the best. Again, this is the same code. Now it, it recognized that this is really an array or a return statement. So this, this if and all of this could be really represented by this. So this is kind of more readable, still not, not as well. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this is the best there is, but it's a part of this function. And the, the bad thing is, and I can honestly tell you that I think I spent just amazing the single function, I spent probably like two weeks full-time work, if not more. Like I was you know, almost waking up screaming at night and saying, ah, God, the world needs to know how simple this function is. Because this is like, yeah, because this function is really, really simple. It calls this other contract and returns whatever this contract returns. So it should, like, this shouldn't be here. It should be just return this. What, what, what gets returned from this call? This should be, this should disappear, really. And it should be like four lines. Uh, and, you know, the problem is that this single function actually breaks under certain conditions. <laughs> so if I just put this line here, I can, like, I cannot simplify it further and maintain the correctness of the program of the translation. Um, uh, it's like, you know, it hurts me so much that I cannot make it any simpler, but I would lose this correctness. Sorry. But on the upside, what it means also is that there is a cool thing about the decompilation process, uh, the way it's performed like here, is that sometimes when functions don't decompile correctly, that means that really you should look deeper and figure out what's going on there. Because perhaps, you know, there is a reason why it wasn't simplified. Perhaps it just lacks certain rules, but perhaps there is some edge case that, that, that's there that you can exploit for profit as a black hat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all about giving better tools to black hats so they exploit contracts sooner so people lose less money. Like, you know, if they exploit contracts at $50, then, then like, people will not lose millions, right? <laughs> no? <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, the, the cool thing is, so this was the original function, right? And this is the final function output. So it really gets squashed and, and really simplified. And again, super rewarding process when you see this huge, huge function, you wonder what the hell is going on here, and, and then you end up with something that is almost as simple as possible. Mm. Yeah, so uh, any questions here? Do you consider a uh, control flow graph while you decompile it? No. <laughs> well, not, not, not in a traditional sense. Like yeah. the, the question is, many, many decompilers do this static analysis thing where they yeah. try to figure out, uh, they kind of try to look at what the compiler did, use some of the hints to split the program into chunks, and then create a graph and try to work from that graph. Right? So I think that's what trade-off bits do. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and here I, I don't do that. I try to avoid uh, any compiler-specific patterns, like looking at compiler-specific patterns, and that's what often, uh, like you know, this control flow usually, oftentimes, you know, assumes there are certain things on the stack or that there is certain structure. And here, no, mm -hmm. and like not, not 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 always, but sometimes. And and there are other tiny things that this thing is actually better. Yeah, uh, if you have a, a control program, then. 
finding group is much easier if you apply the traditional structural analysis on with the control program. Well, uh, some things are easier, and there is, for example, no stop, uh, state explosion. So if there are like five peaks in a row, like this, this approach will break because it will explode uh, in complexity and uh, trying to analyze every path, right? Uh, on the other hand, control flow, like the, you know, people were working on that, they didn't succeed, <laughs> right? So they need to either step up their game with yeah, that. Yeah, but the past, past explosion is problem of the simple exhibition. Mm -hmm. The uh, past explosion is the uh, problem of the simple exhibition. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, if you apply a, 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 the static analysis technique a little bit, then you can uh, yeah you, you can uh, you can get a much easy and nice uh, control program. And yeah. You can get some more structural visual. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. There is it's just an opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I I agree. There is a lot more that can be done here, and there are also like amazing work from from Petra where ah. where they work on a similar thing, but they did it for Java, where where the programs were much more complex and. And uh, you know, like uh, yeah, the, yeah, it's a lot to a lot to talk about. But yeah, yeah. Uh, there were two other questions here. Uh, yeah, if you're reading um, like from storage, um, do you try to make any assumptions what the value could be, like on the logic of the contract? No, not 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 at this stage. So no, no assumptions. But though there is a part, and I will talk about it in a moment, where I try to analyze the structure of the storage. But that's mostly for the naming purposes. But but no, there are, there are no assumptions about what the exactly the storage uh, structure or the storage variables are at that at that point. But I think that the output uh, could be then analyzed, and like some cool stuff would be would be possible there. I hope that this answers the question. Okay. Yeah. Oh uh, well, actually, I have multiple questions mm -hmm. here. But I, here, let me let me follow up with that. And I noticed in your uh, output there. There are things where like you have a uh, storage variable declared as an address, for instance. Mm, and, yeah. And it's like, how do you determine that sort of thing? Okay, that, I will talk about that in a second. Okay, well, okay. And next, let me ask the other question, um, which is, I'm just wondering, can you hit, is it possible at all for you to handle um, like, uh, jumps to like a variable location, like say one that's right from storage. That's that's one of the benefits from uh, compared to uh, to uh, uh, to the control flow. Yeah, this actually handles uh, handles this kind of stuff quite smoothly. Wow. And, uh, yes, I have to talk. Yeah, because so, like you execute. Actually, the, the current version is not as smooth as, as the previous one, but but you actually you know you just execute all the jobs and whatnot. So, like with with other tools that are more in line with uh, uh, with the static analysis of uh, control flow, they oftentimes got lost or or they displayed improper results when someone calculated the jump location or on the on the fly. Mm -hmm. Here, it just calculates it also on the fly, right, and ends up with uh, you know proper jumps. But the question is, what happens if you uh, yeah, like Ren gave some good examples here, uh, like for, for contracts that would broke the other compilers. But anyway, what happens if you jump to a location from the storage, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> so right now, the way this handles it, it's, uh, it does, uh, well, it will just show it's a jump to a storage location of a given number, right? I don't think I encountered many contracts in, in Wild that do that, actually. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a common thing, but yeah, I, mean, I was wondering, because like, you can totally do that in Solidity, so. You can do so many things. Do you know one? What? Do you know one example of this? No. Okay. Yeah, CDFs, uh, CDFs possibly. Okay. Uh, and there are other examples that are closer to that. For example, jump tables, right? So you like current core with a brain fuck uh, interpreter in, in Solidity, right? Solidity. What about your functions? Huh? Huh? Uh, functions? Yeah. 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 So so this approach can be used uh, to handle that. And original approach actually used it quite nicely when you had some jump locations in the memory and whatnot. The current version doesn't work with that as smoothly, but you know, if there was a need, like yeah, the support can be used to, to handle that. I, I kind of try to work on the examples of real contracts, but keep in mind that you know, if there are more contracts that have this pattern, then, then yeah, it, it can be extended to handle that as well. Uh, there was a question from here, I guess. Uh, I was going to ask about, so you have like a, a bunch of rules that you apply, and so that it gives you to think about it. Um, do you have to think carefully about having a rule that maybe stops another rule from applying? Like maybe it's a real simplification, 
and by applying one too early, you like make the pattern not match. Yeah, I, will, I was afraid of, the, of this kind of rules because, like, if you simplify, well, what do you simplify to, right? And if you add some other rule, perhaps it simplifies to something that brings the other rules in turn. So, fortunately, there there weren't that many cases of this. So, so somehow it, it works without causing these problems. There were some cases, but then you can uh, you can you know do various steps. Uh, so you're doing a loop, and, and you know you, you have this set of rules, and then you have another set of rules, and other kinds of simplifications. So so it's it's doable. But yeah, it is some kind of a complex complexity that that, that, that yeah potentially can could cause problems, but it's not very common. So fortunately, that's nice. Yeah. As earlier it was compared to control flow data flow approach. Uh, there are different approaches and each has pros and cons, right? Yeah. And sometimes it may be the case that different approaches may be good for different parts of the program. Yeah. Uh, would you see this as, feas as, as feasible to make some like hybrid combined approach where you I think try to figure out which parts should be treated by which tools? Maybe with some maybe evolutionary algorithm, something like this on the top, trying to pick the best some algorithm part. for parts and later combining this into maybe later better purified results. Do you see this maybe happening? Uh, in point? theory, maybe in happening. Theory. I think what happens really is people just use various yeah. decompilers by various tools and see which ones deli deliver the best outcome for a given function and whatnot. Uh, so, so I think that's that's really the like the practi practically yeah, and yeah. realistically it will be it will be this like this approach uh, like the way I implemented it at least like it really like it doesn't work well with the state explosion but but there are like there are ways to make this approach work just as good even in these cases so so yeah but uh, so I, I think it, so I Roger that from your perspective it's just you know maybe nice idea but in practice it's not worth work because there's a lot of work while you can manually like copy and paste the file yeah. and not compiler to another tool. Yeah, yeah, because I think you would need to, like to integrate to various systems. It, it, it's very complex. Yeah, it's very complex. So there are other things that would be more uh, valuable to do in val val valuable to do in, yeah, I, I would say so. But you know, like if that's if that passion yeah, is I, but still I have like maybe you would say now it's, it would be easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, you uh, how do you actually verify the correctness of the compiled code? Uh, it's not very correct. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but actually, no, I'm half kidding about that. Uh, well, there are a few ways. Uh, actually, I think I have a slide on that, so I will get back to that. Yeah, uh, in, a, in a moment as well. All right? Uh, okay, let's, let me... Or, uh, yeah. I will get back. Uh, I try to remember everything and all the threads that didn't come. So, like a lot of things to hold in mind. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, one more thing that I wanted to s talk about when, before I come to uh, the part where I explain all the answers to all the questions that were here. Uh, I mentioned already the JSON representation at the beginning. And I wanted to talk very shortly about it. How, like, why. Either this or someone else will make something very similar. It's very, very cool. Uh, so, like the cool thing about this series of small letters that people from the back don't see uh, is uh, that it's extremely simplified. So, compared to just you know grabbing solidity or the stuff that people do with with you, this doesn't have, for example, recursive functions or, or anything like that. It usually doesn't have loops, it doesn't have memory access. This is almost a functional representation on, of every function in the uh, in smart contracts. And this, this makes it very, very easy to analyze by automated, automated tools. So, um, so the, there is a lot of cool use cases that, uh, that, that were there. They actually put all, the, all, the, all of this in, in a big query database, so you can search it with JavaScript in 20 seconds. And there were some cool use cases, so Constantinople and chain security uh, people that covered the, 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 the problem with Constantinople. Like, when there was the Constantinople fork, for example, the question was, you know, some changes in the protocol may affect some of the contracts, but how do we figure out which contracts will be affected by some changes? We need to figure out, we, we need to find and search through that, right? So the way we actually found contracts that are really vulnerable to a certain exploit 
was by grabbing all that from the database and searching in JavaScript for all the contracts that match a certain pattern. And I think this was one of the two tools that actually managed to, do, to get the job done uh, with a lot of help and cooperation with the chain, chain security people. So, so, you know, a huge potential also for like some other stuff that I did was finding all the tokens that don't check transfer function properly and allow anyone to print as many tokens as, as you want. That was like five lines of JavaScript to analyze this thing. And, and there were like hundreds of contracts where you could print your own tokens because they messed up the coding. That was hilarious. Uh, five of them actually valid contracts that someone had some money on. So I had to check before releasing that if they are still online. So there were some like sad stories, you know, don't use this contract anymore, like we've been hacked and whatnot. So a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but I also think that this, this approach, uh, in general, that the compilation and, and this intermediate form and working like this, like rewriting the code, is very important for auditing. And, and uh, I wouldn't say that it will replace Solidity code auditing in full, because that gives like certain benefits still, but really working bottom up and taking the virtual machine and and just you know turning it this into some intermediate form language that has a lot of benefit and allows to make very very good tools for auditing. And I would see not necessarily my thing. And if you check the sources, you will see why not my thing is pretty dirty. But, but something like that, I think that's that's really the path for for, for the community to go. Or at least one of the important paths. Is it very different than LLL? <coughs> hmm? Is it very different than LLL? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, like low level, there's like a, a list one. It actually looks pretty similar to that. But it's just like... I, I, I didn't know that one. Okay, fair. LLL? I think it's, yeah, it was like with the original before it started to like a, it's very lispy. It looks kind of like this actually. Yeah, like I fell in love in li uh, Lisp after, after I learned from, uh, from Ari that it's very, very similar to Lisp. So, sure. so, so yeah, I, like it's, it's similar. I, I wasn't aware of LLL, so I have to check it out now. Okay. Oh. <coughs> Give me five minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I will talk about one more thing before I get to the questions. Okay, that was supposed to be one more thing. Okay, one more thing. Uh, so, there is a lot of math going on there in every decompiler or symbolic analysis tool. And most of the tools use SMT solvers. So, these black boxes where you put in math and you get results. And they are very nice because, first of all, they are solid, right? Like they've been written by smart people, battle tested for a long time, and, and they cover all the cases. So, so they work very nicely. But I think, surprisingly, like having a set of rules that were handwritten <laughs> had problems, a lot of problems, but can be sometimes faster. And, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about how math is hard handled uh, in my case, perhaps as a comparison. And I'm not saying this is better, perhaps it's worse, but I just started doing this this way because honestly a year ago I didn't know what SMP solvers were, so I just wrote it my way, uh, but perhaps it's not the best way. So in my case, getting to the Python, Python implementation, like I don't use classes for representing the whole program, I use tables. So this is very similar to like actually like the way this would represent. So, you know, every operation, like if I put something on the stack, I don't know the value, it's not a class of something, it's just a tuple. So, tuples are so nice because they are very easy to compare, for example. So, if I want to cache some computations, I just, you know, I, like it's, it's, it's very, like in Python at least, it's like one operation to, to compare two tuples if they are equal. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so, so, it's all, all one time. Uh, so, it, it speeds up a lot of computations because I cache like, like crazy. Uh, the second cool thing is, working with this, is I have the printout form that's human readable, but when I want to test it in Python, I just copy it to the code, and it's, you know, it's already there, so I don't need to create constructors and whatnot. So this is very, very nice, uh, but, but sometimes like, you know, when, you, when you are getting used to that, it's, it, it can hurt your eyes a little bit. <coughs> now, the other thing is, uh, I also try to flatten and simplify all the forms of expressions, so SMT solvers also do that, so like simplify stuff. But I have a very special, like, canonical flattened form that for a human it might not be the simplest one, but but like a lot of math really assumes that there is this form, so it saves a lot of processing time analyzing all the rules. I don't want to go too deep into that, but for example, you know, when I multiply something, the concrete value is 
always as a first argument. Or there is a certain order of operations. So if I see multiply, add something, multiply, it will be always add and multiply, not, not like this, and not the other way around. So because of this, like the whole math library uh, can, can really have like a certain very small set of rules and analyze just them. It doesn't have to rediscover the whole, uh, the, the whole, uh, yeah, like, I think it's, it's faster <laughs> in, in some cases, uh, at the cost of, uh, of uh, generalization, perhaps. And then I had to invent my custom operator. So anyone that worked deep with, with the bytecode knows that shift left happens a lot of times in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the contract. You like shift all the stuff and move things uh, bit by bit, by, byte by byte. And you mask a lot. So, so you know, let's say that you have a big number, you want to cut off this center here because that's where some, something is, and you move it to the left or to the right. right? So like these operators are used a lot, and I simplify, like also like I simplify all the multiplications, divisions, first to these operators. So a lot of the stuff will be way, way simpler. And then I have this special operator, mask and shift left which is like super difficult to figure out, understand, and memorize, but it really like, cleans up a lot, of, a lot of the output. So essentially, mask SHL is the special operator that was invented that, that handles a lot of operations that otherwise would be these complicated trees of expressions. And I think that's another part where, where, the, decom uh, where the decompiler gets its speed, because it really has just one operator, whereas the regular uh, analyzers would have like a huge tree of, of operators and they would have to figure out each single time like how they tie together. I'm not 100% sure, I'm not a like SMT specialist or, and whatnot, but like this this stuff is fast, so so uh, that's my bet why, 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 why this so. Now, obviously, yeah, disadvantages, it's home, homebrew, like the code is absurdly bad, so if anyone wants to tackle that, good luck. <laughs> And yeah, it's a little bit of a clunky, but then like all the rules, all the math rules were really battle tested on, on all the contracts on the mainnet. So, so really like it, it, it works. And yeah, it may be quite fast. And, and another cool thing is that it is kind of transparent compared to SMT solvers, which are often this kind of black boxes. But then the code quality is so low that I'm not sure it's so transparent <laughs> after all. Uh, uh, and, yeah, okay, the next slide is the answer to the questions. Mm. So I built the whole thing in Python, and Python doesn't have pattern matching, and that sucks, because a lot of work with the compilers is really pattern matching. So you try to figure out there is this pattern in the tables, and you replace it with some other patterns. So for anyone that will want to try out the code, <laughs> I had to fix Python and <laughs> invent custom statements, and you, and, uh, you know, and best programmers know that this is not what you do usually, right? You don't change the language to, to match your purpose. But whenever, uh, like if you go into the sources, you will see a new operator that's actually pattern matching, that handles pattern matching in Python. And I managed to do that without fixing the interpreter. So you, you just run, run plain vanilla Python 3.8, and you can use pattern matching in your own programs. So, so that's, that's quite neat and really simplifies a lot of things. Python 3.8 is required for this. It releases next week. They didn't want to push, uh, push the premiere to today, so, so we have to wait uh, for the official release. Anyway, uh, yes. So now it's uh, a few uh, answers finally to the questions. Then I will talk a little bit about the, about the other tools, and then we have a more relaxed way. I, I, I can see that some people who are getting too impatient, so, so yeah. Uh, First of all, uh, there was a question about the functional identifiers, right? That's, uh, there is this, so the way it works for anyone that, that's not yet familiar, Solidity and, and the whole like EDM, all the contracts use identify functions by four bytes. So you take the function name, you hash it, and you grab the first four bytes of, the, of that hash, and that's the identifier. So that every contract has these functions and only those four bytes as an identifier. Fortunately, someone built a database of four-byte four directory. It's called so. So it's kind of you know it has all the function names and all the identifiers. Unfortunately, it's not that good. Uh, it, it, 
it doesn't have a lot of stuff, and some of the functions, I think someone brute forced to find collisions, so you can find a lot of common functions that just have other definitions that are total rubbish. So I had to build my own, uh, my own for byte directory. Um, essentially, I just grabbed all the APIs that were there, and I absolutely hate scraping Etherscan, but this was the only one situation that I had to do that. So I grabbed all the APIs, I put them in the box, and I built my own directory. So if you download the sources, like on the first run, it will download because it's a huge file. It will it will download all the all, all the four bytes into into your drive, SQLite database. So so if, if there is anything like if you're playing with contracts and you want to have a really good library for, of function definitions, that's that's where you can uh, get that. Um, how do you actually handle conditions now in your code? Like yeah. You have to pick one in your uh, So, like the case I love is transfer function, right? Was it transfer or transfer from? Because it has, like if the parameters were completely different, like that could be handled quite easily, right? But in case of transfer, uh, the problem is that ERC20 tokens transfer, the first pa uh, second parameter is value, and ERC721 it's uh, item number or, or token number, token ID, right? So it's different, different names, and that's quite irritating because there is no way you can figure that out from the source. It requires human knowledge. Uh, so that's why the file with four bytes directory, like the, the way I implemented, is so big. I kind of figured, I look for correlations, so I see, oh, this name of the function usually appears with these other functions, and this appears with these other functions, and then it looks which, which are more similar, and tries to guess based on that. Um, by the way, aside the, the funny fact, uh, I was one of the guys that's great with this can and submitted everything to four bytes directory because I wanted to use all oh, right. And I also had the same problem, and I I want to detect it from that perspective. And I'm actually trying to infer what type uh, type of uh, arguments I see, and then pick the right uh, function definition from, from that side. Yeah. So so okay. Thanks a lot for scraping. It has gone. <laughs> Thanks a lot also for you for uh, making some traffic on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like really like this. A lot of this project came out frustration for it's kind of not providing the APIs. Like we were so dependent. Like if it was all the contracts published on Facebook, like people would, would be like pitchforks, right? But it's all the contracts are on the private companies' servers that doesn't allow easy access and no pitchforks. So like I'm yeah, so again thank you. Uh, having said all that, the function doesn't work properly. So I'm actually I don't distinguish that very well. <laughs> but it should be improved. Yeah, like it could be improved. The data is there, just no time to, to handle that. Mm. There's another cool thing, uh, or, or interesting thing, that um, when I decompile and try to figure out the storage access, the storage where, where you have to access arrays or, or, or mappings, uh, it's like you know a hash of a number plus something, right? So when Solidity or like contract wants to access array number, array at storage number two, position something, it has to hash number two and add something, right? So usually, I just see a you know, hash of this had something that's easy, understandable, good. Unfortunately, in some cases, like the compiler kind of hashes in advance everything, so just puts a big number there, and, and you know, the output is a big number that breaks everything and breaks understanding of the contract because you just see read storage number one, right? Super irritating. So I had to do a rainbow, rainbow table of that, so to speak. So I just, for some courage, uh, like I just precalculated some of that. So, so I reverse and linear ha hashing. I should have called the function reverse, uh, reverse SH83, right? So, so that's the thing. Thanks. Uh, yeah, there is, uh, there is the contract search. So I can put all the data there uh, on the query. Uh, another fun thing that I did on the hackathon, I probably will, will release that sometime tomorrow, uh, next week. Like I actually indexed all the contracts and created that, this instant search for contracts, so we can search contracts by vulnerability. So it takes like 100 milliseconds and you can say, show me contracts that don't check for owner, who, who is calling them before changing the owner, right? And it, it instantly it finds all the contracts like that. And, and it would be super fun treasure hunt when I re release that because it's like uh, hilarious stuff that can be done. Like I want to write a script that just changes contracts, owners of, uh, you know, of contracts to one another. I want to do that, that would be really responsible. But if someone does it, I think that would be hilarious, right? Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> testing. Uh, 
Uh, who asked about the testing? Uh, oh, uh, I have a different, different kind of question actually. Like, um, whenever people create compilers, there's other people that are going to create the compilers, and then there's the next set of people that are going to build obfuscation techniques to actually make it out of the compilers. Um, you build, just build a decompiler. What are the edge cases that you can think of or you already saw? I make it very hard for you to actually. I hear that on the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question here or? Yeah. Oh, so, wait, so with the, with the um, hashes, because hashes are used for storage locations, both for dynamic arrays and for mappings. And like, so does this come up with the, does this pre-computation problem come up with mappings as well, or are you able to just like do it like, or does it never pre-compute those in your file? I will kind of try to get to that in the when I get here and here. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, there was okay. Uh, so there was a question about testing, how I tested and whether this whole thing is valid. So first of all, it is not valid. I don't trust 100 percent the output that it provides. Uh, the idea was to give a brief, like, no, it will allow you to find bugs, but not finding bugs in a contract doesn't mean that the contract is fine. Like. Again, there was a lot of duct tape engineering in, involved in building this whole thing. Uh, I'm quite sure that the approach is valid. And again, people from Castro are working on a very similar thing, just formally verified. So we, I hope one day we will see this approach, but with formally verified basis or like very, very solid. So talk to Eric if you're interested uh, in, that, in that thing. Uh, Having said that, the way I test it usually is I have a few cases, so a few contracts with edge cases. CryptoKitties is always a must for me, like it has a lot of nice edge cases. And, and I have just a few basic contracts that I check, uh, how they compare between various versions of the decompiler. And then the second thing I do, again, I pushed for speed a lot, right? So I, like, it's possible to decompile the whole blockchain within one, one day, I think, right? And go so CryptoKitties takes eight seconds. It used to be two, uh, but like really pushed the speed. So so before release or after every update, I can just go through hundreds of contracts and kind of see what's changed or or see some patterns and, and what not. And also when there is some new stuff, I can I can say oh just show me some contracts that have a certain pattern and then let's see how it's implemented there. So so it's kind of uh, you know not not the perfect testing mechanism, but but so far, it's uh, it's been kind of successful. Uh, like the ideal and gold standard would be to have a recompiler from the decompiled source, right? And to recompile all the decompiled contracts, run the whole blockchain history, and then see how correct it is, right? So the transactions return the same thing, and that would show very nicely how how um, you know how how much of it is is correct, like m most of it, not, perhaps again not, not the edge cases, but that would be super super nice. Mm, and, and yeah, like this is battle tested. So if you get the GitHub source, like command line, I played with some other tools, and it was like, oh, you have to download this binary, and it has to be real uh, runtime, and then you run it, and there are some bugs. Like really, like the command line is as simple, and it works as smoothly as possible, assuming you can Python 3.8. So that's uh, that's the, the problem. Okay, I won't go into all too much storage mapping. There were a few questions about storage, right? So, so can you repeat your question? Oh, okay. So, when you were talking about, um, you know, having these pre-computed rainbow tables for, you know, yeah, like, sure. so, yeah. I mean, and for like, so for, so for for dynamic arrays, this is not too hard because I mean, they're not going to be like the numbers that are going to be plugged in are fairly small. Yeah. So, you know, you you know what your range there is, you know, if you. You know, you're not going to see enormous arrays, and then, and then you, you know, maybe you can do this a few levels down, it's not too bad. But then there's the question of mappings, and because with, with mappings, you know, you could maybe see huge numbers put in, or you know, you know, the domain doesn't have to be numbers even. Just even with numbers, that's enough to expose the problem. So I, I was, I was wondering, since you didn't mention map, is there no problem with mappings because they don't pre-compute it for mappings, or do they pre-compute it with mappings, and you have to expand your technique? Fortunately. Fortunately, uh, fortunately, usually the like they are not pre-computed. Okay. Usually, when when you deal also with mappings, usually, you know, they have to be computed on the fly because the mapping depends on some user input or whatever. Right. But it's, but sometimes uh, adding adding to your yeah, I noticed some contracts, for example, don't use storage number two. They use uh, the person from Zeppelin just went, left, but they, they they have some proxy contract that actually oh. has storage. 
that doesn't have the number, it's, uh, like, it's not indexed by number, but it's really org.zeppelin.something dot dot, dot something hash that, right? So, so in that case, I also have <laughs> I have a table. I think with one or two cases. And the cool thing with, with working with this approach is actually what I did was I was I was running the decompiler and saying, okay, show me all the big numbers that are used as storage indexes and that are not yet uh, you know reverse engineered. And, and you know I took a look at some of them. So this is very neat working this way because you just say. Okay, let's see what, what I still didn't take into consideration, right? And, and I'm not saying that this is perfect, but, but uh, like works for, for a lot of things and it's easy to extend, right? So there is, when there is a new pattern, you can solve that. Uh, I think, yeah, like storage mapping in general, some crazy stuff there. If you go into the source code of this, like that, that was done right before the release, like, you know, you don't want to imagine my mindset when I was working on that, but uh, like some crazy hacks there. Uh, but essentially, like, it's very difficult to map storage. If you want to decompile properly, you have to figure out this storage is you know, storage number two, it's an array, and this is the index of the array, and this is, this is really a structure, and whatnot. Like, very, very difficult. Well, it kind of gets solved, so, so if you want to see, like, I, I will not even attempt to, 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 to explain how it's done, but, but, but it's done, and not perfect, but yeah, it's, I, I think, one of the open challenges to, to really do, do that well. One, okay, I will briefly mention the folding algorithm. So I told you that there is this state explosion. Like you have a lot of ifs, and then you want to fold them, so, so it's really like a very short thing. So I will try to explain the algorithm, because it's hilarious, uh, like, like try to explain it. So you know how you have diffing? Like you have diff between two files, right? So now, the way I do it is, I take all the execution paths, I split them into linear forms, all right? So I do something like diff, but for, not for two, but like for a hundred at the same time, right? So I merge that to a kind of a tree, and then I do a diff on the trees, multiple trees inside, and I kind of merge them together. So that's, I do not, I, I cannot really like imagine how it works exactly, but it's roughly that. So, so the code is super anti-transparent. If you, <laughs> like if you can figure out a nice way, or if you can improve using some knowledge from the other, uh, from the other fields, go ahead, <laughs> and yeah. So finally, a few, a few, and now I'm getting to the CDF, see? <laughs> so this is uh, the edge cases first. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, there is this kind of, uh, personally, uh, there is not that much abstraction of, of, like, the people don't try to make the code that is unreadable that much. I found some of the code, that was super easy, easily parsed. And obviously, it was meant as a, some kind of a security practice. And some of the code was used to even block some of the money from being withdrawn. So, like, that's not a good like security by obscurity is not a good long, like long term practice. And I wanted to say, <coughs> when it comes to CDFs, you know, I like when I started checking CDFs, I was kind of sad because. If it didn't work well with CDFs, and then it hit me, perhaps the CDF creators really have to check with EVM before releasing a CDF. I hope they do by now, right? So, so I'm not that sad anymore because I think there was this guy that had to check for that. And actually, I spent a lot of time on some weird edge cases, thinking of that guy that would be doing a CDF one day, and he would think that he's so smart, and then EVM will solve it smoothly, and then I will, in my mind, say to him, like, in your face, right? So, uh, so I hope that there was at least one situation where someone tried to create the CDF and, and, and there was that in your face moment where, where it went smoothly. So anyway, that's, that's the CDFs and, and I, don't, I try to not spend too much time on them because like, there is enough, enough difficult stuff with the regular contract, but yeah, like, it's, it's a good, good stuff. So, Kestrel, I'm giving it, uh, the first spot as a, as a kudo because they are doing an awesome, awesome thing and very few people know about them. So, talk to Eric if you have a chance. Uh, yeah, that's, that's Eric. So, they did, like, the whole institute is about program synthesis. It was created 30 years ago in, in Silicon Valley. And they did very similar stuff, just way better in the list, ACL2, formally proven, and it works for way more difficult stuff than smart contracts. So for Java programs, right? And, and yeah, and, and for, uh, for cryptographic libraries. And, and I hope that they get the grants or, or, or whatnot to really, to really uh, push that into, into our space. Second thing is contract library. So this is another decompiler. 
I love the guys, the, the code, their website looks like crap, but it's really good underneath. So it's really like it has an awesome technology underneath, like similar in spirit, they just use more declarative languages. Uh, so, so like if you want to work with someone, like they are very good guys. Material, uh, I mentioned it already, like very similar in spirit and, and very nice. Uh, K-Labs, so I guess most of us know here K-Labs and formal verification and, and stuff that was done around Maker. Like the stuff that is symbol, symbolic execution and the stuff that they are doing, kind of, kind of similar in spirit again. So if you get symbolic execution, it will be easier to get what K-Labs is doing. Otherwise, still don't get it fully. So, uh, Manticore, Trail of Bits, again. Now, shout to BigQuery because it's like I put all this stuff there, and really there is a team from BigQuery that is very much into blockchain and Ethereum, and they are very easy to reach. So if you want to play with BigQuery, there are people from Google that that, that really you know that, that, that want to support that. And there are two cool blockchain explorers, Blocksinfo and by Alexi. Like a lot of cool data there, analytics and whatnot. Very open to, to cooperation and Box Scout. I'm actually talking to Box Scout, and they, there may be integration, so they may show uh, sources from EVM over there. Because I think like the problem with Etherscan is that they, they are the only ones, or one of the few that that don't have that don't have uh, that have the access to the sources, and the others have to scrape from them. So if we can have better decomposed sources, it kind of levels the ground because other blockchain explorers can also show sources for for everyone. Finally, chain security. I can see the t-shirts here. Yeah, like thanks a lot for that mention <laughs> in the January article, but also like very good work. And and Pound Stamp, also very good project that we all know. And yeah, this is the last slide I think. Python gets released next week, so anyone can work on the production Python. Uh, sources available, MIT license. And yeah, it would be just uh, playing. Hmm? Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, so finally, I wanted to say like a few words, like what's what's my approach with the project? What, what are the final uh, next steps? So really, like I agreed with him over the last year to to as a creative outlet, so to speak. So I just wanted, you know, I was frustrated with not knowing what the contracts do, and was filled with anger, like a lot of anger, just put into this, so finally figured it out. And there was no business purpose there, there was nothing else. I could, I, you know, I could afford some time to just go deep and, and see how, how far I can go with that. And having said all that, like I feel kind of accomplished in this aspect, so I hope that the community will use all, all this knowledge that I can help other projects, uh, really with, with, with adding some, some better stuff to the, to the blockchain. And, and, and yeah, that's why I'm super open about the MIT license, anyone using the algorithms or not. Like for me, the purpose of the whole project is accomplished already. And you know, I'm happy to see everyone here and I'm happy to open, you know, answer any questions and just help out however I can. And, and yeah, I'm, I hope that someone will, will use the sources. So yeah, I guess this is the moment for thank you. <laughs> yeah, and yeah.